We're taking a bit of a turn this afternoon. This morning was a really heavy focus on sort of policy and, and regulation uh, and, and a good bit of legal background, I think, for how we've gotten where we are as an industry, and I really appreciate that perspective. Part of the reason we're having this discussion, though, I think, is because we have a consuming public who is fairly engaged and interested, informed and misinformed, perhaps, depending on your perspective, about where food comes from, how it's produced and processed, and basically what happens from the time it starts on our farms and ends up in our refrigerators. Wouldn't you agree? And so an important part of that discussion is our partners in the retail chain. So as we kind of gather back to the center circle here, I want to introduce three really important retail partners who uh, I have to commend for being here, being a part of this panel, and, and for taking a leadership position uh, and sharing with each of us their perspectives, their personal and their corporate perspectives on this topic uh, of animal care standards. Specifically, this panel is going to be looking at animal welfare standards from the processor retailer standpoint. Uh, I'm not going to read their bios for you in depth. I would encourage you to, though, look at the packet of speaker bios and read these, and, and they'll each give us a little bit more background as it relates to this particular conversation. But to my left, Jose Rojas, Vice President of Farm Operations at Hormel. To his left, Mike Brown, Director of Dairy Supply Chain for the Kroger Company, a, a fine Ohio-based company. Uh, and on the end, uh, Christine Summers, Product Safety and Quality Assurance with Costco. Please welcome these three panelists. Now, the format for how this is going to work over the next 45 minutes is each of the panelists is going to give what I'll call, in the spirit of our legal presentations this morning, an opening statement. They're each going to share with us five to seven minutes about where their company comes from uh, on this topic of animal welfare standards in the retail space, and then we'll reserve the balance of the time for your questions and conversation among all three panelists. So as we're going through each of their comments, I'd love for you to write down questions and be thinking of things that you'd really like to hear from a retail partner about when it comes to the topic of animal welfare. Uh, it could be some of the things we've already been talking about this morning or perhaps something we haven't even touched on yet. But really, the most value we're going to get out of these presentations, I think, is getting some good dialogue going. And I'll start with great questions from you. Certainly, I'll have some as well. So, Jose, I'm going to uh, open the floor and give, give you the first crack at uh, telling us a little bit about about your perspective and your company's perspective on animal welfare. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon. I hope everybody had a good lunch. A lot of turkey and ham on your tables, I suppose. Um, again, my name is Jose Rojas. I serve as Vice President of Farm Operations for Hormel Foods. I'm not quite on the retail side of things. I've been on the live production side of things all my life. Um, so under that position as live operations, I was in charge of all the hog production entities under Homer Foods, and we had operations in Arizona, California, Wyoming, and Colorado. Uh, since then, Smithfield purchased Farmer John and some of those operations, so today Hormel only has the lab production facility in Colorado called Mountain Prairie. Prior to Hormel Foods, I was with uh, Smithfield Foods for 18 years, uh, managed an operation in Colorado, and managed uh, multiple farms in North Carolina uh, before that. Uh, to my wife's least pleasure, I'm going to move to Minnesota uh, next uh, summer. So two years ago, my address was Arizona, and last year was Colorado, and next year will be Minnesota. So we had to. Uh, Trending in the wrong direction here. Yeah, buy a snowblower, somebody told me, you know. So, um, so at Hormel, we do commit to a higher standard of um, animal care guided by responsibility and a promise of doing the right things for the animals. So what does that mean? Uh, our promise includes a balanced, uh, nutritious, uh, um, a diet that is balanced and nutritious for the, and, and water for the animals, um, environment that is adequate for the animals, facilities that are properly maintained and having the animals in mind, um, having animals as healthy as they can be and when needed, medical intervention. Um, we also subscribe to timely euthanasia with humane methods of doing so. 
Um, we also have zero tolerance for uh, any mistreatment, mistreatment of the animals. Commercial. If my Spanglish is unclear, please throw something at me and I can repeat it to you. Um, You're doing great. <clears throat> so we also have a, in 2015, I believe it was, we formed an Animal Welfare Council that guides a lot of the principles. So with it, frequency, we meet and observe practices at the farms, at the plants, including turkey and the species that Hormel has. We also have um, antibiotic stewardship policies, and we do try to reduce the need of medically important antibiotics. We subscribe to uh, health strategies in our company farms, health strategies that are gonna reduce the need of antibiotics. We partner with key veterinary groups and what I call subject matter experts to in implement these strategies for the long term and, and protection of the herd. And as somebody mentioned earlier, if a group of pigs or a pig gets sick, we do intervene and provide treatment for those pigs. Um, as far as independent producers that supply the Hormel chain, we expect the highest level of animal care from our suppliers of hogs. Uh, we conduct training and verification of such uh, practices through our producers, and all suppliers are required to have a PQA and TQA, which are programs by the National Pork Board of uh, Pork Quality Assurance and Transportation Quality Assurance, so there's training and uh, tests and certification through those programs. So in summary, a few points to share with you. Uh, animal stewardship, stewardship, including the care and humane treatment of animals, is one of our most important values at Hormel Foods. Uh, we have a strict supplier code of conduct and policies relating to animal care and welfare. Uh, we, are, we have completed the move to group housing in our company-owned facilities, and as a side note, I was involved in several states in that transition to group housing in Wyoming, in Arizona, and in Colorado. Um, so I've seen a variety of uh, practices and methods utilize, utilized in that transition. Uh, we, as I stated earlier, we have the Animal Welfare Council that aims to understand and recommend animal welfare practices and procedures for our company. And um, we believe in the responsible and uh, use of antibiotics. And we also live it by training our employees and creating a culture of proper animal care. Isn't that all in paper? It, it doesn't work if the employees and people working with animals don't also believe in doing the right thing for the animals. Thank you. Um, thank you. I come from a little different perspective, but not necessarily in history, because I'm from a small dairy farm in western New York. And let me just tell you about, I lived in Minnesota. I actually loved it, because the sun shines in the winter, which it doesn't do here. <laughs> and second of all, when you're from Buffalo, anybody's weather's better. Okay. So even though in the summer it's hard to beat that, that climate. I've been at Kroger just about 16 months uh, as a director of dairy supply chain, which means I'm responsible for all the dairy ingredients bought for our 21 dairy plants, and that includes a lot of bulk milk, uh, about uh, 4 billion pounds a year, but also a lot of cheese because we have two cut and wrap plants and then a lot of ingredients both for bakeries and for our dairies like dry milk, other products. Uh, we. Uh, the other thing that we do is we buy finished products for the Kroger brand. So if you, if you have Kroger's in your, or some other Kroger uh, com company in your uh, part of the world, uh, we're responsible for getting those products if we don't manufacture or package them ourselves. So it's a big part of our business. Before that, I've spent most of my life in either in the cheese industry or at the farm end. I have actually a degree in dairy science from Virginia Tech. Uh, I call it my cow milking degree. And, uh, and I'm very appreciative of that because it's brought me, it's, it's been valuable out throughout my career because I understand and still understand the farm side of the business, still have a lot of friends in the dairy business, still own a few cows, uh, which is its own story, so we'll stay away from that as far as how profitable it is, but it's better than depreciating a boat, I guess. Uh, as far as Kroger's concerned, their involvement in, in, uh, in animal care really goes back to our, our overall focus on sustainability. We've had good fortune of having a sustainability director who is an engineer by trade, so she very much tries to follow science. Uh, the other, at the same time, every time I get paid, and Kroger pays people once a month, 
So we all learn to be good savers. But um, the, our checks say, this check made possible by a happy customer. So our, even though I buy milk for plants, my end customer is still that consumer. So I, you never forget that at Kroger. Even when I was at Glambia Foods for seven years, and it was mostly B2B, you sold cheese to other companies who packaged it or whatever they want to do with it, whether it be a McDonald's or a Walmart or what it might be, uh, that was the end user. It was very different from Kroger where we basically put it in a package and sell it directly to a customer. So it's a unique perspective because you get sensitive to what those customers think and want. And Kroger is, works hard to balance uh, what the internet gives us today, which is a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of false information, as well as respecting the science. Uh, I think uh, one, of the, one of the things that we have found very helpful is when you have producer groups that become proactive, for example, National Milk Producers in the Farm Program, which I'm very involved in, actually got farm trained certified last fall here in Columbus. And I uh, was glad it was on a Jersey herd because that's my background. But uh, uh, those kind of things are important because we think long term uh, it not only is a, a way for our customers to appreciate uh, that we're responsible, or, but also that it's a way for us to understand industry practice and changes in practice over time. Kroger has over 2,800 stores nationally. We have over 430,000 employees. We're the second largest employer in the United States behind Walmart. So we're a very, very large company, which for me has been a very, very big challenge to get used to because I'm used to being very dairy-centric. We're important, but we're not the whole company. But uh, we're committed to do our best to balance uh, consumer pressures and science to come up with what we think are workable programs on, on animal welfare and animal care. So that's kind of where we are. Great. Um, so Costco, I figured I would start off a little bit about Costco. Um, we're a small company. We don't have as many stores as Kroger. We only have 725 stores. But we are in uh, nine countries now, soon to be 11 um, as of June. Um, but we are $116 billion in sales. So we're the second largest, sorry, we're the second largest uh, retailer in the world. Um, so with that, uh, we have 84 million members um, shopping in these 725 warehouses. And so for any of the, you who don't know, warehouse to us is a store and a member to us is a customer. And they're a member because they pay a fee to come shop in that store. As a result, we know a little bit about these people. They're very educated, um, tend to be higher education. They're pretty smart, they're pretty savvy. Um, and then also when you pay to become a member, there's a little bit of expectation that goes along with that. Um, expectations that are put on Costco um, to do what's right and in, in their estimation what is right and so we spend a lot of time working on that and making sure our members are taken care of. Um, with regards to animal welfare, Costco is very committed to animal welfare, to um, you know the proper handling and treatment of the animals who are out there producing you know whether they're giving up you know they're turning into the food or they're giving an ingredient that turns into a food. Um, but we believe that they need to be treated with respect and with care. Um, as part of that, we do a lot of work with our suppliers, uh, other industry representatives and academia to make sure that um, we are looking at what's best science-based. Um, we do believe that that's important. Um, we think that it's always important to look ahead at new technologies or methods of uh, raising animals. Um, that can enhance the, the lifespan of those animals and the welfare of those animals. And it's not only to us, it's not the, only the right thing to do, it's also the ethical and moral thing to do. And it's for the benefit of the animals, but it's also for the benefit of our members and our suppliers. Um, and so, you know, as we heard this morning, there's the five um, freedoms of animal well-being, which Costco supports and this foundation of our animal welfare program and I think most people's animal welfare programs. Um, as a result of these commitments though, we have to have a way to figure out if these things are actually happening. And so from our perspective, we have instituted an animal welfare audit program. Um, and we do this utilizing third party standards, um, trained and accredited auditors 
Uh, we look at both animal welfare on the farm and at slaughter uh, um, in the processing facilities. And really the purpose of the auditing is to make sure that we can verify that what we think is happening is actually happening. Um, in a perfect world, we would love to say that all of our suppliers are third party and audited on an annual basis, but that's just not reality. Um, there is no one size fits all when it comes to animal welfare auditing. And as a result, we do have what I would term very scientifically a mishmash of programs. And that's not a bad thing. Um, you know, our ultimate goal is to make sure the animals are being taken care of, right? And, and also to respect the suppliers and the farmers who are, who are raising these animals. So, like I said, a one size fits all doesn't necessarily work. That being said, we do work with uh, American Humane, Certified Humane, Validus, you know, all of the top tier programs. We do uh, work with our suppliers on the pork and dairy side with the farm program and the PQA plus program. Um, and then also, you know, we're a global company, so we have to deal with um, other animal welfare standards in other countries. And so we work with those as well. Um, I think really the takeaways for audits is we're looking for continuous improvement in, in the care of animals. We also don't believe audits should be punitive. Now obviously if we see something that's, an, uh, you know, animals are being mistreated, then that's a, that's a definite stop. But in general, you can have some issues and we're willing to work through those issues with you. We just want to see progress. We just want to see continuous improvement. We believe also in outcome-based standards. We're not, you know, we're not the ones raising the animals. We're not the experts. We just know that at a certain point we need to be somewhere. And so how you get there, that's, you know, the farmer's prerogative on how they do that. Um, as far as, you know, our program and, and where we've been, we started in 2005. Um, so we haven't been doing it too long, but, you know, long enough. Um, we started with beef and poultry and that, at slaughter, and that was pretty easy um, for us to, to figure out. And then 2007, we started moving into dairy and laying hens. Um, got a little more complicated. <laughs> I think it has to do with supply chain. The more animals, the more complicated it gets. Um, 2008, we moved into pork, and that's when we started looking at PQA Plus. And, um, and our suppliers, um, our suppliers are using that program. Um, you know, we're still working through the challenges of, from Costco's perspective, in that perfect world, we would like to see an annual audit, and we would like that traceability and that visibility, and we don't necessarily get that, but we do trust our suppliers um, that they're uh, taking care of this for us. 2010, we moved into a veal program, and this is our only program where we're fully from farm to the factory to the store. We know exactly where those animals came from. Um, but so it's a much smaller commodity, right? So it's easier to take care of. And then also in 2010 is when we started working with dairy suppliers on the farm program. We had already had our own, um, you know, besides the American Humane, Certified Humane, but we also had our own Costco uh, audit that we were uh, using. And so um, we needed a little bit more coverage, especially when it came to uh, dairy co-ops. That becomes more complicated to manage that. So we started accepting the farm, but it's the same thing. We would like to see more transparency and more availability of the information. And then in 2012, we tried to tackle the gestation crate issue and we put out our statement policy on that. Um, and I think that was also the year that we decided that any auditing that was done by third party had to be done by PACO certified auditors. So that just raised the bar a little bit more there. And then finally, in 2016, uh, we started our own animal welfare task force as well. Uh, and it's made up of the buyers in our company and the food safety and animal welfare people. We also bring in, from time to time, consultants in, from industry and academia to look at what we're doing and what we're um, reviewing. And basically, the focus of that program is to um, evaluate standards, because we do believe we are 
in favor of standards-based auditing. So we're looking and reviewing those. Any animal welfare incidents that happen to come up, we go through those. Um, I'd have to say, you know, we've been very um, fortunate that we haven't had a whole lot of really bad animal welfare incidents, and I think that goes to the credit to the suppliers who we deal with and the farmers that they deal with. And um, so we just, we're very proud of that. We do some benchmarking with other retailers and uh, QSRs to see where our program stacks up with theirs. And can we share any information? Can we learn from each other? Can we move forward um, together to improve any particular areas? We review hot topics, antibiotics being one of them. Costco made a, a statement that we are committed to making sure our suppliers remove shared class antibiotics out of the, uh, out of the production stream. Um, we just recently joined on to the Coalition for uh, Responsible Antibiotic Use being uh, spun up by the Center for Food Integrity. So we hope to see you know, the results of that study. Um, we, in the consultants that we bring in, we try to learn all the science kind of things that we can. Um, how does genetics play a factor in uh, animal care and animal welfare? Um, and then we try to look for prod new and unique kind of projects we can do. And our latest one we came up with was an online tool that we are requiring our um, egg suppliers to use that will have them do quarterly self-audits, but the, the online tool requires them to do some things to prove it. There's some, so it's not, they just can't make up stuff. It, it's gonna force them to, to do that. And all that does is gives us a little bit more uh, insight into that production, because eggs tend to be a, a pretty hot topic around Costco. And so I kind of bring this back full circle and back to what are Costco's issues coming up in the future, and that goes back to that size thing. Our biggest issue is finding sustainable supply. We are a large consumer of goods. Um, just give you a little example, last year we sold 83 million rotisserie chickens. So that's, that's a lot of chickens and it's hard to find uh, continuous supply because we don't just sell a little chicken, right? If, if any of you know Costco, it's got to be like turkey sized chicken. Um, so it, it becomes difficult to get that. Um, I think we this year um, will hit a billion organic and cage-free eggs that we'll sell. And so, um, like I said, finding that supply. So we're looking at, this is the first time that we've done this um, on the live side, but we're looking to, to go into a, a fully integrated situation. We have a partial one now that, uh, where we don't own the plant, another supplier does, but we contract all of the birds that go into that facility. Now we're building a plant, and we're building from the breeder farm to the hatchery, to the to the barns that the growers will do, um, so we, it's the first time where we get to specify every single thing about that, in order to make sure that we get the birds that we need. Um, on the egg side, in 2015, we came out with a statement that said um, that we were committed to taking our store brand, which is Kirkland Signature, 100% cage free and organic. Well, that's a really easy statement, but there's a lot of history behind that, part of which was we were already, um, we tend to have a higher end clientele anyway, and so they like organics. We're like one of the largest organic suppliers. And so we were already kind of moving that direction, but we had a um, brouhaha with the Humane Society who decided to run a campaign against Costco and Costco's eggs that we weren't doing enough to increase that. And so um, that, essentially ended up, we went and uh, the president of our company went out and looked at different housing systems and, and got, got some education. And so he came out and made that statement that that's what we would do. And so that's where we are. Um, so dealing with the animal welfare activists is a problem. Um, and we're working through that. Um, and then um, our other challenges were global company trying to institute global standards. So trying to move what we do in the U.S. into other countries. And so that's an issue. All right. So as you can tell, we've got a few different 
pieces of the retail puzzle here from the production side on through to the actual customer facing side. I hope you've been taking good notes and have some good questions. The way those will work is you need to you know, raise your hand, get the attention of one of the staff members, will bring the microphone to you. Uh, and so we'll want to try to get through as many of these as we can. I'll, I'll ask the first one. So the, the general question for all three of you is sort of the what keeps you up at night? What's the issue that uh, is maybe of most concern to you at this moment in time or looking you know, six months, a year down the line? And, and Christine, maybe I'll start with you uh, and, and ask it really specifically since you're dealing sort of across a gamut of product lines and, and species and protein sources. Which, which product area or, or species protein gives Costco the most headache, heartache, or, or uh, conversation with the customer, maybe the member, maybe I'll put it in that, that line. Where, where do you, is it in the egg, is it dairy? Where, where do you see that conversation the most? Oh, uh, answer, it's the one that hasn't come up in the media yet. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, actually, we are focused on dairy right now specifically for that reason, is that, you know, come on, you need to learn from the pork producers and the egg producers. Um, before someone's on your farm taking pictures and, you know, that's the next thing that comes in. And I think across all of the different protein areas, though, is just making sure that our suppliers are working on that plan to be prepared in advance and when it's going to happen. Because it's not if, it's when it's going to happen. And we have seen that they've made great strides in being able to get out there up front um, and quash a lot of the issues. So, and the other piece is, comes back to education, and that's a responsibility of us, too, to educate our members in advance, I think, so that they're not so, they don't do these reactive, you know, call Costco and shut down their switchboard because right. they think we're selling bad eggs. But Mike, what, what, what's the thing that on the dairy side keeps, uh, keeps you up at night? Well, let me give the Kroger side first, yeah. and it's actually seafood, because you deal with international label issues, and you deal with international uh, you know, sustainability of seafood. It's the issue that we put an awful lot of time in, not me directly, but I'm involved with the meetings when it's discussed. And it's certainly an area where there's been some labor problems on some shrimp processing facilities. There's been issues, of course, with mislabeling of seafood. So we put a lot of time into that. Within dairy, it's, it's really what Christina said, it's that next, uh, that next publicity that we get. And I don't know if any of you work at all in the plant industry, but we have a, we have a basically it's called SQF, Safe Quality Food, and there's different levels of certification. And uh, we've had two dairy recalls this year in both, not us, Kroger, but in the industry, both dry powders, one in Virginia, one in Arizona. Both those plants are SQF3 certified, which is the highest level. I view farm, for example, just the same way. Just because you have a protocol and you have standards and they beefen them up a lot. I'm, I, when I took the certification last summer, I, I said I could just hear my father cussing back in 1977 if we had to go through all this. But it, it's really put, basically formalized their care and then you evaluate the animals and try to document that. It's, it's, uh, we're very happy with that system. But that doesn't mean you won't have a mistake. So to Christine's point, just having farm operators making sure that the workers not only are trained, but they follow those rules. And again, keep, keep people off your dairy because they can instigate, cause a problem, film it, and then you're in trouble. Often with dairies that are, I know in the case when I lived in, worked in Idaho, in the cheese business, some of the very best managed dairies are the one, is the one that got caught. The guy that was known for herdsmanship. But, you know, so you have to really be diligent. So I think setting a set of expectations, make sure they're followed. I'm a big believer, I think uh, Christina's right on the whole audit process, having third party outside of even farm to go in and check and we, we support that. But the other part of that is just, just you know, don't create a problem for yourself by allowing people to come on your farm, instigate it, and then film it. So on our mind, that is, that is a big one. We haven't been caught in the middle of one of those yet, but to Christine's point, we'll get our turn. It just hasn't happened yet because they're going to continue to work to uh, try to try to discourage people from consuming dairy products. Jose? <clears throat> uh, I will say two things. From the production side of things, the nightmare would be a, a bad disease, like we have, for example, 2014 PED and having to intervene and, and deal with that, talk to the consumers about what that means. So that's one side. But then 
Uh, from the other spectrum is this is activism thing, you know. Uh, we had had some experience, unfortunately, in the last year, including at one of our farms, and um, somebody mentioned earlier, activists have no boundaries. So then it becomes a communication directly between Hormel and folks like Kroger and Costco to say, what does that really mean? Because people that portray these undercover videos or sometimes uh, at night videos and so on, don't have any problem bending the truth. Right. You know, I'll give you an example. Sure. In a video that came out, a pig, similar story than the horses. The pig was laying on a crate, it's like a 25 pound pig. It was happy, it was asleep. And, and with creative editing and some somber music on the background, they say that pig is slowly dying. So those are the things that we have to then communicate with the uh, customers, Kroger and ultimately all the consumers to to say, look, this is what really happens at our farms. The other thing I'll mention is we also do audits. We subscribe to audits because that's the expectation from several points, and internally we do that too, and um, uh, independent producers have a, a group of audits, and our company farms have also audits. Also, to, we mainly partner with Validus, one of the names uh, mentioned before that. Um, so that also provides a tool to demonstrate, and they should be unannounced audits in my opinion, and that's what we subscribe at the farm. So, so people don't have um, the opportunity to prepare. And at the end of the day, there's no preparation to capture less than ideal animal care. You'll know it if you have it or not, even if the audit is announced, because there's symptoms and culture when you interview people that you can catch. There's opportunities here. So. Great. Good start to the conversation. As you have questions, raise your hand and uh, I'll follow the microphone around and we'll take questions from the floor for e each of our particular panelists or any individual panelists that uh, you want to query. And I'll uh, start with the distinguished lady from Feedstuff. <laughs> Um, obviously, you all have to hear from consumers and hear what they want, and you've made some decisions based on what you're hearing. But then you go back to offering choice to your consumers. How do you balance the need to provide choice while still maintaining, um, you know, production standards or your animal welfare? And you know, Costco and, and Kroger. I know this isn't up your thing, but you know, Kroger has announced that they're going to go cage free for all their eggs. Um, you know, what does that mean for the affordability of eggs for your, all your consumers? Your Kroger is a little different than Costco because you're not a member driven and everybody can go shopping there. So talk about that balance between choice and, and how you balance that. Sorry if that was too long, Mr. Andy Vance. Yeah, you were on the cusp, but I'll allow it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that first. Hold the Kroger, mic up real close, Mike. Okay. Kroger is, uh, as you know, is a, is a broad, it's, it's the classic supermarket, but we've made a lot of changes over the years. And part of that's because of the customer, customer base. I mean, I'll, I'll be very honest. I used to live in Seattle, and I was a big fan of Costco. In fact, I used to work with them some on the dairy buy side. And a big fan of Fred Meyer, which is a Kroger-owned store. They both serve. What I like about Kroger, or Fred Meyer, I can buy paint and cheese in the same store. At Costco, I can buy those wonderful three-pound chickens you were talking about. But uh, you have to meet at broad, in our case in particular, because we range from value customers, the folks that look at Aldi as their alternative. We have people that look at um, organic or, or what we call naturally produced, whatever that really means, who is maybe that Whole Foods customer. So we have a very broad base, and we work very hard to try to meet the needs of all of them. Uh, on the standpoint of, of dairy, the standard is the same for all except, of course, for organic, which has to meet the humane standards that we set working with farm as well as, obviously, the organic standard. On the egg side, uh, that, was, that was really consumer driven. And like 15% of Kroger customers buy cage free. To me, that seems questionable. And, and you want to know what? I'm one of them because I was raised with chickens and I like them. <laughs> so I'll just be up front with you on that. Yeah, is that where we need to go? I don't know. Has the industry done a good job? telling the consumer that they shouldn't worry about things like that. You may have more issues with pecking and other problems. I don't think so. Uh, so part of that is it is how, you, how you're driven, how you're pushed. Um, and I think where we run into trouble, and again, it's that mix of science, mix of welfare versus, you know, what the, what the crazy lady on the Internet said that everybody likes to follow. 
and it's, and it's a real balance. So we also, I think we gave ourselves a 2025, we have some time to get this done, we know it's going to raise costs. It isn't necessarily raise feed costs a whole lot, but it's certainly going to affect, you know, just cost of structures, cost of, uh, it's going to take more space to keep the same number of chickens. So to say it's a perfect solution, no. Is it, is it driven by our, our consumers? Yes. And I think one thing that, uh, uh, one of the challenges we have, and I know this, if you've ever been surveyed on the phone and someone asks me about my eating habits, it's going to sound a lot better than if you see me and you say, you oh, know, he sneaks a few more uh, hamburgers than he says he did. Uh, it's the same thing with, with those kind of things. It's very hard to evaluate. So we have empathy for that. Uh, we recognize it's going to raise costs, and we expect to pay more for eggs. We also think over time that those costs will moderate once, you know, it's like everything else, which is production practices get honed. It's one of the reasons we're giving our egg suppliers, which we have very close relationships with, plenty of time to, to adapt. Because it's, it's not easy. It's not simple. It's, it's kind of like Christine's example, finding the chickens that meet your standards. It's tough when you're a large volume producer to do those kinds of things. So it's a mix. So to say that eggs is, uh, is uh, it was done, why was that done? It was because we felt in the long term it was best for our business and best for what our customers were asking for. Does that mean uh, uh, that it was perfect? No, but then one could argue nothing's ever quite perfect because there's lots of different opinions and in this country frankly we reach the point we listen to the news that tells us what we want to hear and so there's just not the open discussions that we used to have and that goes far beyond eggs and, and milk. Christine I want to get you involved in this conversation not necessarily specific to the Kroger egg decision but as a, as a wannabe economist Mike you said it well uh, we lie to survey takers all the time right so I always go back to and, and ask the question what did the cash register data tell us so the, how, do, how do your companies balance 10, 15 percent of your customer base, or maybe not customers, maybe they, they're just people out there making noise in general, saying this is what we want, be it cage-free eggs or organic milk or, or something along those lines, with this is what our POS data actually tells us our customers are buying. What's that conversation or that decision-making process look like? For us, it is, it's very easy to um, see what our shoppers buy yeah. because you have to have a card and sure. you have to do that. Now, I don't use that information for that, but I know the buyers will look something at that. Um, but it also is a lot, like I said, our customers are very verbal. So I don't even have to really look at their shopping data to know that they want organics. Um, you know, they want cage-free eggs. They want organic beef. They, and they're buying it. So, well, that's my question: is do, yeah. does the data, does the qualitative data, match the quantitative data, or do the anecdotes match the sales I, trends and so on? I think in our instance they do, but I think also keep in mind though that when, because of the volume that we can buy, mm -hmm. our costs tend to be somewhat more controlled sure. and plus we don't have to maintain a large number of SKUs. Yeah. We have one or two, right. you know, so all of our energy goes into those one or two SKUs. Unlike so, Kroger where you've gotten an, an unreasonable amount of shelf space dedicated eggs because there are a million different eggs today compared to when we were kids. Do you want medium, large or jumbo? And we can tell you exactly how many we sell because we have our value card and so we know what customers buy. Of course we have sales data. I mean, a huge part of our business, I expect this is true with Costco, is that data tells us where our customers are going, what the trends are. And we see a real diversity. We have that value customer who wants, they're not real worried maybe how the chicken was raised. They're trying to feed a family of four on 22000 a year, whatever the salary may be. And then we also have that, that higher end customer that that matters to. And then what's really interesting when you look at shopping baskets is you have customers that want certain things. My favorite is the how many, and I can't tell you the exact percent because I can't remember an impossible, I'm not allowed to tell you, right. but how many consumers buy organic milk and conventional milk? And our joke is, is that the kids get the organic and the husbands get the conventional. But that, that isn't a joke, by the way. I think that's accurate. We buy two different milks at our house. It's not organic in our case, but I drink Fairlife and Honeybee drinks just, you know, whatever the Kroger brand milk is. So well, I, 
we share a body shape, and I drink fair life too because I want less hey, carbs. Hey, and, and you know what? East Broad Street needs to start carrying the red label fair life. I am ticked as a customer. They won't carry it. Get that damn skim, skim out of there, and I want, the, I want the red label. Now, before okay. you put your foot in your mouth, when's the last time you checked? Last Saturday. Because we went in January across the country. Country adding the uh, full We pad. will talk afterward, my friend. Well, you need to talk to your store manager. I did, it twice. Should be, it should be on the show. <laughs> all right. All right. Now, Jose, I want to get you in the conversation here before we diverge into Andy's milk preference yeah, too much. Speaking of which, that is, we do have our own line called Carbmaster of High Protein Milk. You know, we could do a whole session on interesting marketing because it wasn't until I started buying the Fairlife product that I realized you guys had had that. For a while, that wasn't a new thing. Anyway, Jose, so so the question for you is on the production side or, or on the um, processor side. You guys have a wide range of products under the Hormel brand. Some that would be for sure geared toward that value conscious customer. Everybody loves spam, all the way through to others that are maybe a more premium product. So how do you then at that level react to your retail partners and the kind of conversation we've just had? and trying to develop products, market products, carry it on back through your farm production systems, and try to meet this ever-changing conversation about what customers do or don't want or what our retail partners are telling them they do or don't want. Yeah, so Hormel, as any other companies represented here, depends on the consumer to survive for many years. We just celebrated 125 years, at least past summer. Uh, so lately they invested in companies um, that provide a variety of portfolio. They purchase Applegate, which is uh, mm -hmm. organic, all natural. That's part of the Hormel portfolio based in New Jersey. They also bought Justin's uh, it's a organic and natu uh, natural brand of uh, spreads, like almond spreads and peanut butter. So that provides Hormel the flexibility to uh, provide that uh, variety of uh, products to the consumer. So then, with the with, with sales force or the marketing team come up through cooperation with the consumers through a different product or, or uh, raised on gestation, uh, tra uh, uh, not crates, but gestation stalls or, or group housing or raised without antibiotics. So then that gets translated to the farm level and we then evaluate what can we do and what can we do. So through the years, those kind of things have been assessed and evaluated and then Sometimes they come to the end and sometimes they don't, but it get impact at our level. And like I said, a program of RWA, for example, raised without antibiotics, you have to have a, an alternative because it will be inhumane to not treat an animal, pig, chicken, whatever, uh, if needs to be treated. Yeah, good point. Well said. Uh, let's go before I monopolize all the questions. Dr. Helms, I believe you have a question from the floor. Hi, I had the privilege of communicating with a large group of egg producers a couple months ago, and one of their concerns is the durability of the decisions that retailers are making in their supply chains. So, for example, the decision to go to cage-free eggs um, was an extremely costly one from a producer perspective and costs more from an input perspective as well when the science said, um, let's look at enriched colony housing as a better option. Um, so their concerns are around um, the durability of the decisions you're making. Are you going to stick by those commitments and, um, you know, pull that through so that they can eventually pay for these facilities over time and, and um, basically have a living at the end of the day? I'll take that first because I think organic milk is a good example for us. When we started our organic program was with a uh, – we have a – a milk processing plant in Hutchinson, Kansas, kind of central Kansas, as you might imagine, not the biggest population base, but we had a lot of space and we needed to put in an extended shelf life line. Our simple truth milk, the milks, all the half gallons are processed there. And the goal was, is it two things. First, we wanted to have a, a, a milk supply that was going to be consistent and available. And second, we recognized that there was a lot of cost to transition. So that was started with five year contracts. Now, it's a little different with organic because um, it takes, takes time to convert. I mean, uh, I always joke, I said, it's kind of like if you're a Protestant and you marry a nice Catholic girl and you have to go take those classes to get trained. Well, you've got to convert to be organic. And it's a three-year process on land, a year process on cows. And so you had to, they needed to have a stable market. So that's how we approached that. We've actually continued to offer multiple-year contracts on organic. 
Uh, on, the, on the chicken side, we're doing essentially the same kind of thing where we're partnering with, with our current suppliers who are willing to make the commitment to guarantee that they have a home for those eggs because quite frankly, it's not just the right thing to do from the standpoint of ethics. Um, you're not gonna get funding to make expansions if you don't have a guaranteed market with those kind of costs. So it's really up to us to make sure that they have those, uh, though they have a secure market. Yeah, I don't think I really have a whole lot more to add because that's kind of our perspective as well. Um, we do partner with the suppliers, say on the egg side, we even um, help them source feed. Um, so uh, uh, reduce cost. Um, and we're committed, we do long-term contracts and we don't work with that many suppliers. So um, we are committed to the ones that we have. Other questions from the floor for our distinguished panel of partners? Take the yes, um, so time. as far as cage-free goes, this is a statement, not a question. As long as it's so this is like This is like when you say bless your heart, right? Like, I'm going to go ahead and do it yeah, anyway, it but anyway. as long as I say I'm bless my, your bless your heart at the end, it's okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I have I a question it. that follows. Um, <laughs> concerns about avian influenza as an animal health official when the birds are outside. So that's a concern long term. My question is, what policies do you have to protect these certified analyses or inspection reports from third-party subpoenas? Do you have processes where you either discard them within a certain amount of months, you can keep the, whatever the, the scorecard is, but you discard the actual documentation? Um, what, what have you done in that regard? In other words, or if I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit, you know, for your suppliers who are audited, how, how are we able to protect their, their data and information from other interested parties, shall we say? Okay, interesting question. Ours is simple because Mike, Mike, our Mike, please, would you Mike? Been on milk. Oh, sorry, it's it's been on milk, and with the farm program, we don't see the audits. We get an affidavit from the co-op supplier that the farms are in compliance, and in the case of who can see those, in most cases, it's the farmer alone, or the farmer and the co-op, or the farmer and the buyer. Uh, Glambia, uh, whoever forward cheese company, also has a lot of independent producers. Uh, but it's it's the same it's the same uh, same relationship. We don't see the audit. We are made aware of challenges for correction, kind of to your point, Christine, when there's things that need to be fixed. But uh, part of that is for that for that liability that stays within the uh, con uh, in, in the control of the program. Same thing with audits. We may we may be aware of problems, but we don't we don't. Uh, Glad we didn't collect paperwork. We're not interested in the paperwork. We trust our vendors are, are meeting the requirements of the program. I can speak a little bit to that. So at, at the farms, we have a, an audit program, and that audit also requires visit of previous audits, mainly for the purpose of following through with the corrective actions identified. So we have a limit, I believe, I believe it's two years on farm audit. But we also believe in transparency, so we have shared those audits to uh, consumers that want it, you know, not out on the public, but if Costco calls more, Kroger, or Walmart, where maybe we have shared those in the past, you know. So, but we have a limit on farm audits have to be out of the farm after two years, mainly to follow up on the corrective actions. Okay. I'm willing to yield a little bit of the balance of my. Oh, go ahead, Christine. You had an additional thought. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to yield some of my time from the end because this is a great panel. If we have another question from the floor, we would take another question there in the back. Well, my question relates to imported protein products. Um, I know during the High Path AI, we were importing table eggs due to the shortage of production within the United States. So in the event that you import products from outside the United States, do you have the same auditing process, the same standards for, for that protein source? Um, we do for the most part, let me put it that way, for uh, We'll get a lot of product out of Australia, New Zealand, Brazil. Those countries have the same audits. We utilize the same audits in those countries that we utilize here. Um, I'm not aware of any particular items that we import from countries. Like I said, we operate in nine countries, and so some of those countries have some um, challenges when it comes to animal welfare and finding animal welfare audits and stuff like that. Um, but 
at this point, to my knowledge, we're not bringing anything in that into the United States that has not been audited to United States standards. Okay. Right. All of our stores are in the U.S., but certainly, again, seafood is a good example. Yeah, we do do international audits and not just on animal production, which is, for the most part, for a lot of us, is seafood, but also labor. Uh, you, a lot of our stores carry, they may carry towels, they carry a lot of things that are very well often made in Asia or South America somewhere. And we do do audits of those companies, and we do have a continuous improvement program, again, third party. Someone else does the audits. We don't, uh, we're not experts at that, but we trust people that we hire to be experts at that. Mm -hmm. As far as dairy, we import very, very little dairy, uh, a little bit of butter, uh, a few cheeses, and uh, they're primarily out of the EU. Uh, but we don't, we have not. Our domestic supply is 100% from farm, uh, enrolled farms. In fact, they've all had at least one audit already before we'll take the milk or the cheese. Uh, on, on the EU, we don't buy enough yet. We haven't made that investment. Uh, I know a lot of those countries do have their own programs, but we haven't tried to certify that yet. We're still getting our hands around uh, our domestic animal production. <laughs> the distinguished gentleman. <laughs> First of all, I'm always impressed. I'm a practicing veterinarian. I'm always impressed with the value and the, the quality of the food that you people provide for us to buy. Now, I'm, a, I'm concerned as a veterinarian. Here's my question. My question is, we've decided to turn the chickens loose, the pigs loose, and other things. What are you doing as a company to supply the food that they tell us is going to be short in 2050 if we don't do the things that the industry has shown us to produce a very vital source of food that is healthy and is very economic. What are you planning to do about that issue? I'm going to move away from the protein to the grain that makes it. Because I think our biggest threat is this whole GMO scare, and that's exactly what it is. And I'm talking as Mike Brown now. I'm not talking as Kroger, because we still have our customer issues to work with. Uh, we have a lot of concern over anything that's going to reduce the production of grains in the U.S. by 15 to 20 percent on something that has absolutely no effect on nutrition or health. Uh, that's a big concern of ours, because that raises the cost of food. Uh, as far as letting chickens run outside, last I knew Cage Free wasn't having chickens run outside. Uh, are those things we need to be addressing? Yes. Do we need to be straightforward with our consumers on the cost effects of those things? I think yes that we do. Uh, in the end, we're going, to, we're going to try to supply what our customers want. I also, again, maybe we're going to have different tiers of, 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 of products for people because, again, we, we serve people that are very, very meager in their income as well as people that are very, very wealthy in income, and they buy different things in the store. And so we're pretty much obligated to try to help them all. And so to your point, yes, I think we have to be very careful that we don't overreact. And am I saying we've never overreacted? Yeah, maybe we have. But uh, that's, that's where we're going to be long term. And uh, I think we, we've got to get this. We have been frustrated uh, with people who are uh, trying to make claims on things that have no impact on human health but only raise the cost of all, of all feed. I mean, if we all go GMO free and milk, what's that going to do to the cost of feed in the United States? and indirectly the world. To me, that is the kind of thing that I'm most concerned about. I think a lot of things that farm is asking dairymen to do is going to make them better dairymen because they're going to have action plans. They're going to have employees trained. They're going to have a vet, client, patient relationship. Those are all really good things. Uh, but when we get into the faux science, I'm, I'm with you. We need to be very, very careful we don't overreact. And it's, I wish it was easy. It's really not. And a lot of that is Simply, we need to work all together on communication. Make sure people understand some of those feedstuff articles that we need to be in the New York Times. From your, your, your lips to God's ears, right? <laughs> Christine? So, you know, <laughs> Costco hasn't gone to wanting to turn the little pigs out or to turning the chickens out or, I mean, it really, our, our perspective is you can have the best housing system and the worst management is not going to get you anything anyway. Or you can maybe not have the best housing system, but you have great management 
and that's good. Ultimately, it's the end of the day and how the animal is taken care of. The eggs, we did go to a commitment to move to cage-free. Like I said, that's part due to customer demand, part due to um, just the philosophy of when our CEO decided to go out and visit housing systems and we took him into enriched colonies, which he was very good with. Um, we took him into caged and he wasn't, he's, you know, that was a little disturbing. He'd never been there. He wasn't educated. Right. And that's exactly why he wanted to go do it. It's because he had all these people calling him. And for, at, for a Costco, if you call, you get a call back. It's not, um, and he wanted to be knowledgeable. So he went out and did that. Well, when, at the end of the day, he felt that cage free was an environment that we should move towards. And it was, you know, he had scientists come in and talk to him and he went and visited and, but that's not to say we're going to jump on the bandwagon and say everything has to be free range or organic or um, ultimately like I said at the end of the day is the animal treated well. And thank you, sir, for bringing up, I think, a really good point, and I'll talk about it a little bit in my closing comments, but we have a real challenge, particularly uh, you know, in this country or the Western Hemisphere in general. I call it first world problems. Daddy would have said we uh, have more dollars than we have cents. We can afford to be picky. Um, and unfortunately, I would say their customers, by and large, our friends and neighbors, don't care about the starving kids in Africa or the third world or what else. It's not that they don't care. They don't care. It's not real to them. You know, I, I'm okay. My kids are okay. I want to buy what I want. It doesn't really matter if we can feed the 20 or 50 or not. And the survey data generally shows that, that starving kids in the third world really isn't a, a, an item that moves the needle for the U.S. consumer. It's sad, but it's true. We'll we'll shovel money in at Christmas time at the collection plate, you know, to help. Uh, we'll, we'll do that, and we'll feel good about it. But in the bigger picture, we don't care. Last question, can, yes, ma'am. Can I add to that real you, quick? You may, can for I sure. Add, Please do. And I'll share a story. You know, we'll be naive to say that our production systems are perfect. There's plenty of opportunity to improve what we have. Yes. To kind of narrow that gap. Somebody once told, once told me, and that's the Twitter moment for the Twitter lady, I don't know. So somebody <laughs> told me. I hope you got it. It was a good one. Well, it's coming. So that somebody told me, there's no pig, pig Jesus, okay? So don't wait for the pig Jesus to come and fix everything at the farm. It's us that know what to do, M me probably excluded, people at the farms that know what to do, doing it and executing it right every day taking care of the pigs, but also being efficient at the right time. So I think there's a lot of opportunity and efficiencies on the last, you know, pigs, chicken, a lot of that, and then partner with genetics company and, and grains company. There's a lot to do mm -hmm. still. It's a concern everybody has, but there's still opportunity with what we have today. Yeah, great. Great point. Okay, with that, I've yielded a good 15 minutes out of the last session for this panel because I thought it was exceptional. I think it's not terribly often that we get to sit face to face with our retail partners or our key processing partners, three of the largest, most influential companies in the food value chain. So let's give them a hearty round of applause for being here and being so candid.